Good afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon and welcome to latest episode of our entertainment show. As you know, in part three each week, we run a special series called Into the Vault series, where we look at iconic movies or TV series uh, throughout the decades that have left their mark on the TV entertainment industry. So whether it's a 60s uh, romantic story, a 70s cowboy and western movie, maybe it's an 80s police detective show, maybe it's a 90s horror, maybe it's a 2000s uh, sci-fi show, or maybe it's a 2021 uh, futuristic show, whether it's a TV series or a movie, we delve into some of those that uh, made their mark and still will be remembered to this day. In, the, in our special last month or so in Into the Vault, we've been looking at American-based TV series and movies, but we're going to go closer home to home this week. We're going to look at a British sort of TV series with a sort of twist, actually, because it took on a sort of a topic, uh, a bold topic, and the Greek mythology, mythology city of Atlantis uh, in terms of delving into Greek mythology and the storylines. Uh, a bold production for a British sort of company and a full British production to go in. It ran between 2013 to 2015. Uh, 26 episodes on BBC in total. It's some of its cast members were Mark Addy, who played Hercules, uh, Robert Ames, who played Pythagoras, Aisha Hart, who played Argiana, Sarah Parrish, who played Pacify, Gemini Rupert, who played Medusa, uh, Juliet Stevenson, who played Oracle, and the lead sort of male role, the cast and lead male role was Jason of Aragon, but we didn't actually get to see the Aragon part of it, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, Jason uh, was played by the one and only Jack Donnelly, who joins us stateside there this evening. And uh, Jack, um, Atlantis, is it still hold special memories for you, your time on that? 26 episodes. Uh, I was speaking to Mark uh, there earlier on. He said it was flat out for the two seasons. It was fairly full intense, but he'd do it over again in a heartbeat if the opportunity was there. Is it the same for you? Did you, was it exhausting, exhilarating, but at the same time enjoyable? 100%. I completely echo Mark's sentiment. Um, if I could go back, if the opportunity was there and I could be guaranteed that all the same people would come back, yeah, I'd go back and do it again. It was, and still is, just one of the loveliest experiences I've had in my professional career. And hi, by the way, James, thanks for having me on. No problem, no problem, uh, Jack. And uh, Jack, in terms of your, when you heard about this role, when you heard about the Atlantis sort of TV series, uh, what was your initial sort of take? How was the sort of pitch to you in terms of what they were trying to do and in what sort of way they were going to put you in terms of link you, dare I say, to Atlantis and sort of that lineage in terms of that and how you were going to be bedded into the storyline? Because obviously you started off being a person born in modern times in the 2000s and 20s and all of a sudden you're cast back more than two maybe 2000 maybe more 5000 years and such how did they try and throw how they were going to bed you into that sort of environment yeah i mean i mean the funny thing is i was thinking about it before doing this interview it was um 10 years ago exactly that I would have been about to do my very first audition for Atlantis. Um, I was in London, I was an actor, I hadn't been out of drama school long. Um, I'd had a couple of good years acting wise, I was starting to book more than I did when I first graduated. And then the audition from, for Atlantis came through my agent and it was, uh, it was just one of those ones that straight away off the page, picked every box in, in an unbelievable way. It was lead role in a great project with unbelievable so supporting cast attached with um, reputable producers who'd done good work before, the chance to horse ride and sword fight in Greek mythology. I mean, I, to be honest, I wanted it more than anything I'd gone up for in a while. Um, and the nice thing about Johnny Caps and uh, Julian Murphy, the producers is, they were known for taking chances on unknown actors, on trying to discover people rather than going to already established names. Um, they'd done it with Merlin and discovered Colin Morgan um, and Bradley James. Uh, and so there was a tiny little part of me that thought I, I might be in with a chance here just because these guys are known for doing that um, because I hadn't really done that much before. And then in terms of 
Jason starting in the modern world and then being washed up on the shore. I just, I loved the whole take on Greek mythology and that they wanted to explore it without adhering too closely to it, that they wanted to reinvent it and introduce it to audiences. And I just thought it gave the character such a wonderful secret to hold on to um, that could be explored throughout the seasons for as long as we went. And Jack, obviously your success and you would be you have full element to this that you had two sort of uh, dare I say two leads beside you through every sort of episode in terms of uh, Robert Ems and Mark Addy. You were the sort of three musketeers as Mark uh, described you as well. It, but did that sort of help you in terms of budding into that sequence that everything was shot between yourself and uh, Mark and. Uh, Robert each time that it wasn't dare I say recurring cast members what we have in the sort of lead role sometimes is the one guy uh, might be pitched pitched in in these different sorts of sequences and there's no help uh, uh, no help dare I say in terms of that but you had these two sort of uh, contemporary actors uh, beside you the whole time so you were able to play off each other was that a real sort of win-win situation for yourself? Tremendously. Um, I think that was probably the single most uh, beneficial part of the whole thing um, for many reasons. Like I said, I hadn't done that much before. So to be flanked, as it were, by Mark Addy and Robert Ames, even though Rob is my age, he had done a lot more stuff at that point. Um, and I think actors learn from other actors. So just watching those two, I think, helped me as an actor anyway, get better over the course of two series. And, you know, there's a lot of luck that goes into making a show you're hoping that chemistry is going to be there that actors are going to work together that it's going to flow um and i think the thing that surprised us all in the best way was just how brilliantly mark rob and myself got on and how much that influenced the writing and the show and what the tone became that you really very quickly realize oh this is a this is a buddy show this is a show about three friends um because we did become so close and felt so at ease in each other's company and that that played a huge role in how the show then developed mm. and one thing that struck me about Atlantis is someone who uh, looked at the sort of read the, the characters in the team and never seen the sort of show and turned it on and they had the expectations of what they might see uh, it's very different in terms of the the characters I mean the take on Hercules the take on uh, Medusa as well it, it's so off the beat in terms of what you would think visualize in terms of what they would be like as well. So that all just makes us intrigued, intrigues you as an audience because you just don't know where they're going to go from episode with these sort of characters because you can't really judge on the history because they've actually thrown a spanner in the works, dare I say. Yeah, I think that was part of the brilliance of um, Howard Overman, the writer and creator, and Johnny and Julian. They knew the tone, they knew the audience, they knew what they were trying to do. There was almost no point in their minds of sticking that close to the source material because we'd know what to expect. We know where the stories go. We've studied it, at least some of us. And their audience, I think, especially in season one, was much younger. And they thought, well, if we can introduce this material to uh, our audience who have probably not heard of it before and excite them in a way that makes them want to go out and read Greek mythology and look at what the stories really are, then that can only be a good thing. And it gives you the added benefit when you're writing a show that you can surprise people rather than go, okay, well, this is exactly what happened. Um, we've got to stick to it. And again, you know, anyone that criticizes that, this isn't real history, it's Greek myths. The, the clue is in the title, it's mythology. You can do with it what you wish. That was and, my Jack, favorite. and Jack, uh, Mark brought an interesting point, and I'm going to bring this to you. He was talking about the time BBC set for the show. They set it for half eight, but in your eyes, you had probably said more tea time, sort of uh, taken at five or six o'clock. And they wanted you to, the BBC wanted to be a bit bolder and darker, but you weren't, you weren't going down there, I say, the Spartacus route with the blood and the gore and the nudity. Uh, that was associated with the Spartacus. You were a sort of a different production as well. Did you feel maybe that the timing of when BBC put on uh, the, the thing was as well, that it should have been geared maybe more to that six o'clock slot rather than a half eight, nine o'clock slot? Yes, I, I think, I mean, 
you can look back and you can try and dissect why things happen and things go a certain way and the, about the life of a, of a show. Um, I, I think this, I think, as I said, Johnny and Julie and the producers, they're, they're brilliant guys and they're wonderful to work for. And what they did with Merlin was really incredible. But Merlin came out at a time really before streamers, before Game of Thrones, before for, I think it was before Spartacus, certainly before Vikings. And when Merlin first started, I, I believe it came out at 5.30 in the afternoon. It was a much lighter, more family-friendly show. And it start time pushed each season as the actors grew and the, the show became darker. Now, when we started Atlantis in the first season, I believe we came out around 7 o'clock, 7.30, if memory serves me, which I think is a good time for families to tune in. It's a family drama. That was the show. That was the tone. And it it worked. Um, but by the time we got to the second season, shows like Game of Thrones and Vikings and Spartacus were really creating waves. And I think the BBC felt, and I don't blame them, that they wanted to go for that audience. They wanted to compete with those shows. Um, and so they pushed the start time and that led to darker material it, it certainly the second season shifted in tone and to be honest from an acting point of view i really liked it i liked playing that stuff i liked the storylines i liked where we went um but i think you know it it's hard if you're then shifting away from families and going more towards that 14 15 year old teenage audience they're already watching game of thrones and those other more mature shows uh, and I think we lost some of the family audience when we did that. Um, and, and maybe that that went against us. Um, having said that, I know that the X Factor was on ITV and every week they would shift their time to match ours. So we continually went up against them. So who knows, you know, why things happen and what the higher ups think. I know that a few years le later, the BBC came out with Troy. So maybe they decided, you know what, Atlantis isn't the way to go. We want to do this more mature show that has a more adult theme. And they did Troy Fall of a City. So I don't know. For the two years I was on it though, I mean, I, I loved it. I had the, the best, best time. And Jack, uh, in terms of the stunt scene, in terms of sword fighting, in terms of jumping over bulls, in terms of the horse riding sequence, did you get head first into all those sorts of scenes? I know most actors are stuntmen and really qualified stuntmen, but did you, anything that was possible to do, did you give it a go yourself? Everything. I did everything. Head first, launched myself in, loved it. The horse riding was probably my favourite part of the entire thing. Um, obviously, we filmed some of season one and two out in Morocco. So to be out there riding horses through the deserts was, I mean, dream come true for a boy like me that grew up in the New Forest near Bournemouth and stuff. That's all I ever wanted to do. And we had a phenomenal stunt team um, that was so... Uh, accommodating and generous with their time and teaching me and teaching me how to move and how to fight. And they let me do pretty much everything, all the flips, all the sword fighting. There was one stunt in Morocco in season one where I had to run and jump off a building and it was 40 foot up in the air uh, to land in on, on a mat on top of a bunch of cardboard boxes. And I was desperate to do it and they wouldn't let me. And then when I saw the stunt happen, I sort of recoiled and went, Oh my God. Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Watching it as opposed to thinking about it was very different. It was, it was terrifying. And I suppose, Jack, I suppose in terms of the, the female leads and in terms of uh, obviously you had a, a real great uh, chemistry with Sarah Parrish, who played Pacify. Uh, I, I thought she was outstanding uh, throughout the two seasons of the show. She really stole it. But in terms of the love interest, I suppose it was easy enough to play a love interest of a a a Aisha Hart, who played Adriana uh, in terms of that. And uh, were you obviously at a young age? Did you always have much in common? Do you sort of giggle at that sort of sort of the, the onset chemistry that you had to take? Did you find it funny and amusing? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, I did. I mean, I liked the, the entire cast, everyone that we had on this was lovely. And again, I think that added to the whole atmosphere. Um, beyond just working with Mark and Rob, Sarah is one of the funniest people I think I've ever worked with. Um, Jemima Rupa is just a dream. Uh, Aisha is extremely funny as well. And that, I think, you know, that was the weird thing. Ariadne, the princess that she played is not particularly funny, 
but Aisha in real life is. Um, so yeah, we would often laugh right up until they were shouting action. And then it would be that moment of very quickly trying to breathe and get yourself together and go, okay, concentrate, concentrate, real acting now, real acting. Um, and, and it was lovely. It just made the whole two years so easy. Um, and yeah, we had a lot in common. Um, I had a lot in common with Robert Ems. I think, you know, I just saw him recently. Um, and as you said, Sarah Parrish, uh, we've just worked together on another job um, that I was doing. So it was great to be back with her and catching up and, uh, laughing all over again. And Peter's Jersey, who was in season two. We were yeah. all on something together. And I suppose, Jack, if a cat had nine lives, uh, you definitely had nine lives, uh, or even more uh, in terms of Atlanta cinema, the amount of times you were put to date and narrowly uh, sort of escaped. And it seemed every episode uh, throughout the two seasons, it was uh, sort of Jack escaping the Grim Reaper. So uh, it was amazing the Grim Reaper didn't co come up as a mythological character in Atlanta as such, because you were probably have met him a few times, dare I say. Yeah, absolutely. At some point you start to think, I mean, I know you're making good TV, but you're like, come on, Jason, calm it down a bit. You're making your life really difficult here. Just just have a day off. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. I would have liked to have seen, because I, I know where um, Johnny Julian and Howard wanted to take series three. Uh, if we were going there, we were out, the Argonauts were being collected. We were on the boat, we were sailing. Um, there was going to be, I think, another Cyclops, uh, further stories. I think Achilles was coming into the show. I mean, it would have got really, really exciting. I think there was talk of me, Mark and Rob all having beards um, or maybe Robert M's just having a tiny goatee in episode one. Um, I really like the introduction. Uh, not many people remember. Maybe they do of Anya Taylor-Joy. Uh, you know, again, she was started off in Atlantis and is now like a huge star um, playing the Oracle. So that was interesting to see where that went. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, for as much trouble as I got into in series one and two, I think season three would have, would have outdone it. And Jack, obviously in real life, actually, the character, the, the fictional sort of story, Amy Manson sort of character who came into it there is, but actually yeah. in real life, her character and Jack actually do in Greek mythology, do actually sort of hook up in terms of that, in terms of that. So obviously that was just, that story hadn't gone away. So obviously there was, they were probably going to a sort of a three-way sort of love triangle in terms of a, a bitterness sort of thing, I suppose. That character was your character, I say, was prone to be very prominent in the, the yeah. quarter two seasons to come as well. Yeah, for those that know their mythology, as you clearly do, the Jason Medea story is it's dark and it's intense. And also, you know, Ariadne, I, I didn't get quite into it with Johnny and Julian where they were going to go with those stories, but I, I do believe it was going to take a darker turn. Um, I I don't know if both those characters were coming back after the third season. Uh, and I think Jason starts acting slightly out of character, but the episodes were never written. So it's all speculation. I don't know where it would have gone, but um, I mean, listen, uh, I, like I said, under the right circumstances, I'd go back. I'd be curious. Yeah. And uh, Jack, in terms of your own work now, have you anything in the pipeline in the near future that might be hitting our shores here in Ireland and the UK? Obviously, what's on the UK TV is very much on Irish TV as well. Yes, um, I do. Actually, I just I finished a film last year uh, called Us or Them, which I believe is coming out in the next couple of months. Um, and right now uh, I am currently I have a studio here at my house. Uh, I'm in the edit on a pilot that I wrote and directed um, and shot just before Christmas. So that's being done right now. And then we're moving ahead, hopefully, with the rest of the series. Um, I can't say much more than that because uh, the people that financed it are putting out a press release, I think, in, in a week's time. But yeah, so right now I'm up in a studio with an editor choosing between different takes and cutting something together that I wrote. And uh, Jack, our final two questions now, and I've asked Mark and I asked Jim and I these two questions. If you saw Jason coming down the street against you and he passed you by and you were there with uh, your your wife or your sister or your mother or, or your brother and they asked you, Jesus, uh, Jack, you played uh, that character, Jason. What's he sort of like? What type of a dude is he? How would you describe him in terms of what type of a guy Jason was? Um, honourable through to his core, um, someone that 
just fights for the underdog and for things to be fair um, and a little bit goofy. I think that's what he is. I think, um, do you know what, what, I, what I loved about He's innocent, character? is he? He's he innocent. Bit, yeah. I think that's the thing that I loved about the whole, that Johnny and Julian's take on the show was, you know, you're playing Jason of the Argonauts, but as they put it to me, he doesn't know he's Jason of the Argonauts. He doesn't know he's the hero from Greek mythology. He's a guy who grew up without parents and is in search of his father and is a little bit lost and he will go on to greatness, but he's not there yet. He's just discovering it all. And that to me was far more interesting to play this sort of underdog character who, gets entangled with these other two guys and goes on adventures. And finally, Jack, uh, in terms of this, I had heard some stories from Mark and I heard stories from Jim and I in terms of uh, funny takes uh, in between uh, shootings or sets or running sort of gags in, in terms of uh, Atlantis. Do you have any sort of story that you would like to share with us? doesn't have to involve you or maybe involves one of the other sort of cast members from your time and, uh, this strikes a memory with you even to this day that still makes you laugh and still makes you resonate when you think of them or when you think of your time on that. that just... Oh my God, I mean, there were so many. I mean, it was, people talk about pranks happening on set and, you know, this cast and crew loved it. First of all, the entire crew and cast set me up to believe that Michael Crawford was going to play my dad. Um, with the intention of having me believe that I would have to sing a duet with him. Um, and, you know, I wasn't against the idea of Michael Crawford. I was like, okay, not the direction I would have necessarily gone in. But, um, but yeah, sure, I get it. And then they had me believe that I was going to sing. They had me set up with a fake singing teacher that I was doing emails back and forth with. The whole thing that there was going to be some musical number throughout in one of the episodes. And I don't really sing. So that terrified me. Um, and then I know Mark just, this is gonna sound so immature, it's so immature, but he wet willied me in so many takes, just licked his finger and stuck it in my ear um, the whole time. And then I, on the blooper reel, you'll see, I mean, this is probably too much information. There's a scene where Mark is supposed to be asleep. And then I just snuck into the back of shot and licked my finger and it was covered in drool and then stuck it in his ear. And do you know what? Here's another one. I had a painting commissioned of Robert Ems running through the desert in Morocco uh, in nothing but a dressing gown and his skivvies because he did that one day when we'd finished um, shooting in a lake. I took a photo on my phone of him running across the desert and then had a friend paint it and gave it to him as a present. But I had the painting put up in the back of a scene while he was in the shot so that everyone could watch it while he's delivering this really meaningful monologue. And behind him is just him streaking through the desert of Morocco. I think he's still got that painting. Yeah, 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 yeah. You definitely were a bold cast, I know, uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, definitely the stories Jim and I taught me as well. It was a bit dark as well, and uh, yeah. dare, I, dare I say, anyway. So you definitely pulled out all the stops, I know, uh, that's for sure. Uh, Jack Donnelly, a pleasure talking to you this evening to relive your memories of placing playing uh, Jason of the Ar Ar Aragonauts, uh, Jason of Aragon, during your time of, in Atlantis, appearing in 26 episodes between 2013 and 2015. Pleasure talking to you, Jack. I hope the project goes very well for you in the near future. Stay safe, take care, and God bless. James, thank you very much. Take care.